Roxbury Board of School Directors meeting at 6.32 on um, uh, October 7th. Uh, so first order of business is public comment. Um, we have some members of the public um, either use the raise hand function if you understand how it works. And if you don't, basically, if you hit. Um, oh my goodness. The participant button, you can raise your hand. Or um, if you don't understand how it works, just uh, make yourself visible and raise your hand physically. Okay, so we have two, uh, Meredith Warner and uh, Nissa. Um, so let's start with Meredith, please uh, announce yourself to the, the camera um, so people at home know who you are and also so it's on the record. Thanks. Hi, my name is Meredith Warner. Um, I'm a community member and uh, one of the members of the Just Schools Initiative, I'm here speaking on that group's behalf this evening. I first wanted to say thank you to the board for all the work you've been doing, especially to the charge committee uh, for hearing public comment for all the work you've been putting in. We really appreciate it. Uh, we have a little bit of feedback and then a couple of questions we'd, we'd hope to hear about tonight. Um, we first want to appreciate the commitment to the composition of the committee being 50% plus representation from BIPOC, LGBTQA+, and representatives of disability justice. And we'd just like to offer that we can help to achieve that goal, uh, and, um, and we could be a resource to you on that. Uh, we'd also like to see that same goal applied um, to the survey of stakeholders and really stress that students, caregivers, and community members be included in the survey of stakeholders because their perspective is really essential to gleaning a full understanding of the impact. We recommend um, the charge also include the exploration and reporting of data or lack of data on SRL arrests, referrals to community justice center, or other interventions, including complaints against the SRO. Uh, the reporting should look broader at broader exclusionary discipline practices, and all data should be broken down by race and disability status. And then finally, I just have a couple of questions uh, that drill a little deeper into the creation of the committee itself. Um, so what will the process for selecting the committee members look like? Is there going to be an application process for students and community members? Um, how, how can interested community members, parents, caregivers, faculty, staff, and students express interest? And what would outreach to those groups look like? Um, who will be responsible for choosing the designated representatives from the district, et cetera? And beyond the aforementioned targets around representation, what, if any, criteria will be used to select committee members? Um, and again, uh, on behalf of Just Schools Initiative, we're really appreciative of your time, and uh, thank you for uh, giving me a space to give comment. Great, thank you, Mer um, Meredith. Um, Nissa? Yes, thank you, Chair Murphy. For the record, my name is Nissa L. James, and I'm offering public comment tonight as a Vermont resident and a mother of two students currently attending Main Street Middle School for the board's consideration. I am extremely concerned that the educational opportunity available to each student at Main Street Middle School is not on substantially equal terms when compared to other towns. Specifically, the April to June lack of educational opportunities, the 1 10 p.m. dismissal time, which limits academic activities from September until now, and the inability for Main Street Middle School students to access remote educational offerings for students attending in person at Main Street Middle School is furthering the inequities that existed previously. This is clearly compounded by the fact that Vermont's number of instruction days comprising the school year already falls behind the majority of other states. 
In response to the announcement that schools could move to step three the week of September 22nd, many districts communicated the process of reviewing local data and reviewing teacher feedback in implementing step three plans of which normal school start and end time, end time can be a component. It is extremely important that this type of information is shared with parents of students at the Montpelier Roxbury schools. Our family received a letter on 922 after that announcement indicating that a move to step three does not change our plan, but parents were not actually listed among those who had developed the plan. The letter did mention that transitioning from step two to three allowed athletic teams to play against other schools. With regard to risk for exposure, I am perplexed why a normal school start and end time would not be implemented if the decision was being made to allow athletic teams to play against other schools. So my request for the board is to add a specific agenda item to these meetings for discussion of the COVID-19 response enacted by the Montpelier Roxbury School. Thank you. Thank you, Nessa. I think that concludes um, public comment. That was all the raised hands. Uh, last call. Um, other board members, let me know if you're seeing a screenshot. I'm not. Okay. Um, thank you much. Now we are on to um, Onto the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Jim, um, before the consent agenda, because um, it's kind of like public public comment, I just wanted to um, say that um, I'm going to be resigning from the school board, um, and my last meeting will be the first meeting in November. So there'll be a vacancy on the board just while people are. We have members of the public here might be heard more widely. Just wanted to share that news and share it with my fellow board members, and I'll be sorry to leave the work, but I feel like I've reached a point where I can't devote the time that I need to to, um, to be a responsible board member. So sorry to interrupt the agenda, but I wanted to say that. Uh, well, um, thank you, Bridget. I, uh, I'm understanding of the news, but also sad, and it's been wonderful serving with you over how many years? Four or five? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> six. Um, uh, but you, but I, I cannot express enough um, what what a wonderful colleague you've been on the board, and also how much work uh, and great work you've done uh, for the school board. Um, the the district the district is in much better shape uh, since you came on the board, and you have been a big part of that. I think you've really um, done a great job of of directing the board and directing the school through some some changes, both the Roxbury Village or the Roxbury merger, the, uh, you know, change in administration, um, a lot of other changes along the way. Um, and you have, have been uh, razor sharp and definitely the hardest working board member, um, you know, that, that I've, I've experienced since I've been on. So uh, I, I completely understand I will be very sad to to move forward uh, without you, but also um, you're well do the rest, um, and we we thank you profusely for for all you've done uh, over the years. Um, the the district has, has benefited greatly, and uh, I think we all the whole community owes you a, a big gratitude of thanks. So so thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very kind. It has been an incredible team to work with for all these years, and um, I also just want to say that I'm happy to talk to anyone interested in serving on the board. Really encourage people. It's a great opportunity. Feel free to email me, and um, I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested and has questions. Um, and thanks, everybody. No, no, thank you, Bridget. Um, do you want to make the, the honorary motion to approve the consent agenda? And I move that we approve the consent agenda with the addition circulated by Anna. Uh, do you have a second? Second. I'll second. Um, um, any discussion? Uh, Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Anakin? Aye. 
Emma? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Jerry? Hi. And Ryan, who I'm not, oh, oh, Derek, call you Ryan? Bye again. Okay, um, I think I've got everyone. You're all mixed in with the crowd. Um, um no, I'm here too, uh, sorry. Oh, Mara, your, your phone number, sorry. Uh, and Mara. Hey, hi. Okay, thank you. Um, so now, um, Protocol. It's not on a board discussion. We just wanted to talk briefly about protocols over um, board communication. Uh, I had Libby send this around um, just because there's a lot of new board members. We've obviously had some, um, you know, we, we've had some issues where there's been a lot of community feedback. Um, you know, so I just wanted to kind of go over. Uh, you know, the basics of, of uh, communication, I'll just do it very quickly. And then if there's any questions, uh, let me know. I think the, you know, the biggest overview is we want to keep things as much as possible, um, you know, filtered through the particularly requests of the administration, uh, filtered through Libby. Um, and you know directed to the administration and then obviously if you know if there's not a satisfactory answer that can come from the administration then, then the board will take it up but um you know i think our, our biggest job is is to uh to listen to, to what's being said um you know try to direct the person to the uh, correct uh person in the administration you know so if someone comes up with an issue about ues uh, you know, try to direct them to Ryan um, or MSMS say, you know, have you talked to Katie? Uh, you know, and if they have and they've had an unsatisfactory conversation, then ask them if they've talked to Libby. Um, uh, you know, and if, if ultimately they've talked to everyone, you know, tell them to come to public comment or to write the board. And, you know, there are some things that we may be able to put on the agenda, but, you know, try to direct them first. To the administration because that's oftentimes the easiest place to get an answer and you'll find that some community members uh will come to you as a board member and you're the first person they've talked to and they but they know you you're, you're their neighbor um you know your your job is, is first to redirect them to you know the person administration who can address the problem um if it's uh, another place you can direct them you also direct them to to me, again, if they've gone through the, you know, particularly the administrative ranks, um, you know, put it on my radar. Um, I can talk to Libby and see what the story is. Uh, you know, if she's had a conversation, if they have a conversation with, you know, so it's a UAS issue, conversation with Ryan, a conversation with Libby. Um, you know, Libby and I meet regularly, we can discuss it. And if it's something that needs to go to the board, um, I, can, I can take it to the board and obviously, uh, you know, check back with me, see how that conversation went, um, you know, keep in constant communication. Um, and, you know, if, again, if it's something that the board needs to take up, we can do that, but that's kind of the last um, channel. Uh, another thing, um, try not to directly, there's, you're in a tricky position as a board member. Um, yeah, if you have a direct issue, go go to Libby or me. Don't go to the administrator. Um, but, you know, under Libby with your board hat on, it can really send confusing signals. Um, you may think you're doing it rather innocently, but if you go to, you know, say Ryan or, or Katie, uh, or Beth and say, boy, it would be really great if UES did this differently or if MSMS did this differently. Um, you know, you're in a weird position of kind of being part of your boss's, of their boss's boss. So they may interpret that as a directive. Um, you know, in years past, there were not clear channels like that. It caused confusion um, and some, you know, conversations that board members thought were innocent conversations with administrators. Um, 
again, it caused some confusion and some, uh, you know, misinterpretation that, that created, I think some unnecessary, uh, you know, just some unnecessary issues that if you have a, a clear, clear chain of go to Libby, uh, you know, Libby will, Libby will help direct you. Um, you can also go to me if, if you're, you know, you don't like the response you got from Libby or if you want further help, but don't go to the administrator directly. Um, you obviously can go to any administrator as a parent, but, you know, make clear that you're coming with your parent hat on um, and, you know, make, make a request that you think is, is a parent request as opposed to, as opposed to a board member request. Um, social media, uh, in general, if there's an issue that on social media that really requires a response, um, alert me to it and I will try to respond. Uh, we can certainly discuss the response that's needed. Uh, the biggest trap with social media is if you're responding, um, if you're responding as part of a, a chain conversation and doing it in a board member capacity or something that could be perceived as a board member capacity, a lot of the board members are on these chains. Um, comments are oftentimes hard to see. Uh, once you get to a certain number, three or more, you are arguably in a position where you've created an unnoticed open meeting. Um, and while the the law is a little unclear on that, uh, and it it hasn't been tested. There definitely is the possibility that board members on a, a social media chain uh, discussing a school matter um, could create a a unnoticed um, public meeting. So something to be very careful about. That is also true with email chains. So. Uh, if if a discussion is started on our either our private or our Emma or our uh, Montpelier Roxbury uh, email, uh, particularly about a substantive discussion, and uh, you know multiple people chime in, that also becomes a where people get on the chain. Uh, there's an open meeting violation that likely occurs. Um, I think that's that's most of it. Uh, you know, if you have any questions about whether a correspondence is appropriate or not, um, you know, let us know. Obviously, you can also you can definitely respond to constituents. Um, just in terms of I I got your 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 message. I understand, uh, particularly if they're giving you know feedback for a board matter. Um, you know, like the recent SRO position, um, you know, obviously that's something that's already before the board, we're taking it up, um, you know, so you can definitely, you know, respond, let them know you, you've heard them, uh, give them information about what the board might be doing, you know, here's our agenda, et cetera. Um, so that is all perfectly fine. Um, so any, any questions about that? I, I know it can take a little while to kind of figure out the nuances of it, but uh, I think the, yeah, I think the, the biggest thing to, to remember are, or the biggest things to remember are, you know, direct people as much as possible to the proper administrator. If, if you get specifically a specific question, um, be very careful about starting any sort of chain on either social media or email that could violate um, uh, the open meeting law. And, you know, be very careful about your, um, your correspondence with administrators other than Libby to make sure that you're not giving the appearance of giving them some sort of directive. So questions from the board? Okay, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so if we get um, if we get emails, um, at what point does it make sense to maybe direct to you to be a point person or a voice for the board? And when does it make sense for us to just reply? Um, like, let's say someone emails the whole board all yep. at once. Who replies? 
Uh, generally, I will reply, and, and, and that's been the um, that's been the protocol in the past. Uh, um, I will do like one of two things if you want a specific reply. One, you can definitely acknowledge that you got it and say thank you for the input. Um, if you want to make sure that a certain substantive thing gets communicated, I would communicate with me first because you know technically we we are supposed to be a body that speaks as one um so i would do that you know you can definitely acknowledge you know, thank you for your note uh you know we heard you and you know and you know it's on the next agenda you could you know that type of communication is fine if it's something substantive um you know talk to me uh, before I respond and, and we can discuss it. Because what we want to avoid is a situation where uh, the board appears to be speaking with, with two voices. Emma? I just want to clarify the document that was included in our board packet. Yep. Um, it says that it's a protocol document, but I can't find the protocol or the procedure um, in, the, in our policy documents that are public on our website. So I find the expectations for Montpelier Roxbury board members, but no procedure there. So I'm wondering if this is just sort of like a summary that um, that Libby, maybe you put together, or if it's an actual adopted procedure of how to interpret the policy. It's not an adopted procedure. I can let Libby speak more on it. I think it comes largely from uh, materials and trainings we've had with the VSBA over the years on over the on this subject. Yeah, we had a board member ask as well. How do I respond to to this 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 new board member? So Jim asked me to put together a protocol for it. Um, so it would fall under one of those policies, but it wouldn't be up as a procedure. Procedures aren't adopted. The the policies are. Okay. I don't know, Jim. Um, we do have a policy about communicating with the superintendent um, that I believe some of this, not all of this by any means, that some of this touches upon. Yeah, it, this falls under the board expectation policy as well as the board superintendent relationship policy. Both of those policy it touches on. The social, the social media, and it, I actually think it would be helpful for us to have a training with uh, Susan um, from BSBA because she's she's really well versed in the open meeting law, which ultimately, ha I, not all of this, but half of this, and I talked with Jim about this beforehand, half of this is really aimed at ensuring that, you know, we have open meetings and whenever a quorum of us is meeting, whether as a subcommittee or as a committee, we're doing it in a transparent way and in, a, and in an accessible way to the public um, because it can be a slippery slope. You might just not be talking about something very, you know, trivial with some other board members, but still um, we, we have to watch it because of our role. Jim, I, I also think it might be worth touching on the power of the board as a collective versus the power that individuals have, as well as, you know, none of this precludes an individual's First Amendment rights. I mean, and we're not always going to agree on absolutely everything. Sometimes, you know, the board will make a decision. I think as a board member, it's it's best to say, you know, the board has made a decision on this. You know, we're, we're moving in that direction as a board. I, Andrew, I don't agree with this. My general perspective on this is A, but the board decided B, and, you know, I'm going to respect that. And the board ultimately as a collective has the authority, and we're moving forward in that direction. So that's the situation. But I understand where you're coming from, and, you know, I didn't vote in favor of this. Yeah. No, you can definitely explain your personal positions. Um Yeah, but at, at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 supposed to be one board that speaks with with one voice. So if you're if you're articulating, you know, a different position, I think you have to be very clear that you're doing that as an individual and not on behalf of the board. It might not hurt since we're talking about all this communication 
process again to maybe reconfirm the norm that the board has operated with regarding the superintendent's executive assistant. We've historically interacted with what is Anna's position now a little bit differently. Um, you know, we might ask for a warning or we might ask for a specific document or something kind of directly from the superintendent's assistant. Um, it seems like the relationship there is a little bit different than a normal administrator. And as I understand, I think everybody has been comfortable with that so far, but I just want to get that out there again too, as we're discussing all of these relationships and how we're working together. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Ryan. I, I, I do, I, Anna does play a different role for the board um, in terms of warnings and things like that. So I, I think it's appropriate for you not to use me as a mediator when you're asking for a warning for a policy committee, for instance. Um, but feel free to CC me on that as well. Um, because Anna does, Anna actually knows more about that than I do. So, <laughs> so she would be the appropriate person to talk to for warnings and things like that. Yeah. There's another example that came up recently in our policy committee that um, made me think about, you know, when I read the actual policy, it didn't seem like anything that we were planning to do would be in breach of that policy. But then when I read um, the board protocol document that is included in the board packet today, um, it seems to signal, signal otherwise. Um, so there was a, a moment, Ryan, maybe you can remember this, or Mara, you were there, and I think Bridget was there too, but where we were looking for more information about whether um, power school or something would allow us to uh, do what we wanted to do under the new gender policy. And one of us said, oh, I'll, I'll give Ryan a call or I'll give, you know, one of the principals a call. And so, but that communication should go through Libby. Libby, we want to know if power school does this you cannot go directly to that would be a breach of the policy yeah. you wouldn't be able to email like a clarifying question well i mean some clarifying questions are um they seem easy but sometimes it's you know like boy could you give me the budget numbers from the last 15 years on on x and that goes to grant you know in the middle of budget season when he's working you know 60 hours and he doesn't know like well do i need to drop it, all this and and you know, find this information for, uh, you know, Andrew or, or Jill, um, you know, it's hard to, you know, tell a, a board member, you know, too busy. Um, so, you know, that's why it's good to have Libby be the gatekeeper of what could even seem like a simple clarifying request. One, one other thing, Jim, I was just referencing the expectations for the, for the board members. And um, in there, it does mention the chair can speak for the board, um, but it also clarifies that the chair cannot act independently or direct any actions by themselves, which gets back to the collective power of the board. Not any, no board member has any special power to act on behalf of the board but without you know, the will of the board, but the chair is the de facto spokesperson of the board, if you will, speaking on behalf of the board. Yep. Other questions or comments? Yeah, and feel free to you know ask ask me or Libby as it it comes up. It it um, um yeah it, it takes some it takes some time so. And, and Jim, maybe you and I can talk about whether it's worthwhile to have Susan Holson come back from the VSBA because I look around and without Bridget and a new member in Bridget's, Bridget's Square here on my Zoom screen, we'll have an overwhelmingly new board. I think Andrew, Bridget, I don't even think you were there, Jim. I think Andrew, Bridget, and Ryan might be the only board members who participated in that training. Ryan, were you in that? But, yes, we were yeah. all there. So it might be a good idea. That was a good training. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely, um, I think regular comms training is, is very helpful. Um, yeah, and things evolve too, uh, especially with, with social media. Um, and, and now with, with Zoom. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, we're, we're interacting with the public in, in ways we haven't in the past. And, um, you know, the laws aren't necessarily catching up. So it's, it's always good to make sure we're, we're in compliance and be effective. Um, 
Okay, so uh, we're gonna move on. Um, Emma or Mar, do you want to talk about the the committee charge? Do you want me to to lead that discussion? I'm happy happy either way. You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, I believe last week um, the days are blurring. Uh, the three members appointed at the last meeting to put together a charge and some guidance on the discussion around uh, school safety and police relations, which uh, also encompasses the SRO position, uh, met to put together um, a proposed charge and also some recommendations around both timing and composition uh, of the committee. Uh, the proposed charge is in the packet. It, it roughly follows uh, the the resolution that was passed, um, uh, basically, you know, highlighting and putting together a committee to look at the aims and expectations for school safety, uh, evaluating uh, the district's primary safety concerns, the historic roles and duties of the SRO, uh, successes of the SRO, uh, challenges and concerns that have arisen around the SRO, uh, and how the SRO position and district safety uh, are being and have been uh, evaluated and accounted for. Uh, also defining the aims and expectations of justice in our schools uh, more generally, uh, especially evaluating the impact of current and historic systems on all of our students and in particular uh, BIPOC, uh, LBGTIQA, uh, disabled and other students uh, that have that are members of historically marginalized groups, uh, defining the aims and expectations and the role and conduct of the police in our schools, uh, given justice, safety, and DEI concerns, um, as well as you know, the values that the school um, uh, uh, wants to, to move forward with, um, and, and also uh, to conduct a survey of stakeholders uh, uh, as well as, uh, you know, taking interviews and testimonies of, uh, you know, key members uh, who have uh, a role in decisions around safety, uh, including uh, the district administrators, uh, city officials, uh, police officers, uh, teachers, uh, guidance counselors, and obviously, uh, you know, parents uh, and members of the community at large. Uh, the proposed committee composition uh, uh, was uh, three board members uh, uh, as well as uh, two students. And we also felt that in students, we could include some recent graduates uh, who are, are freshly out of the district, especially uh, with uh, more than usual, um, perhaps being still local given COVID or, or able to participate virtually from, uh, you know, from afar, uh, especially since we've had some, some students in the past who have had uh, both experience with the SRO and deep involvement in the evolution of the, the district's um, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, two faculty or staff, um, ideally uh, guidance counselors or social workers, but um, recognizing uh, that that some of, of them might be in a position where they're they're reluctant to speak out given the relationships they have with with students and with the SRO over the years. Uh, two administrators, our feeling was that Libby should not be a member of the committee just because she uh, has uh, a, a vested role in carrying out uh, the the safety charge. Uh, but obviously Libby would uh, would come to the committee and, and give testimony and um, give her perspective. Um, three community members, um, three board members who would likely be the three board members uh, already assigned to this. Um, uh, one member of the city council uh, and one member of the police department who we felt should not be either the SRO or the police chief, but obviously we would want to hear from the chief and um, 
potentially the current SRO or former SRO. Um, efforts uh, would be made to um, make the committee as diverse as possible and to get as many voices of, of uh, historically marginalized groups. Um, and efforts would also be made to represent uh, both the communities in our district as well as RL for schools. Um, the board can discuss a way to uh, recruit um, uh, members to the committee, assuming that they accept the proposed composition. But um, you know, one way we've done in the past is to uh, open it up to the public and have uh, interested members write letters, short letters of interest uh, to either the board chair or the board as a whole, um, and then come back and, and pick from those interested members um, uh, for the proposed committee timeline, we kind of thought about having a staggered timeline, given that we feel there's, there's a couple decisions to be made, uh, given the budget timeline, there's an immediate decision or a relatively immediate decision about what to do with the SRO position from a budgetary and other perspective, uh, that we need to make in time for, uh, you know, passing the budget. So we would need a recommendation by December. So that way, uh, Libby and Grant can, can accommodate that in the budget that they put forward and that we approve in January. Um, but we also felt that that was just a piece of the conversation and a, a piece of what this committee should be charged to do. Um, so, uh, and also that doing doing the work of putting together a really broader report that looks more holistically at safety um, in our schools and in our district, um, you know, through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens uh, was not something we could, could do uh, justice to uh, by December. So we set a timeline of a broader report and recommendations for that by March. So, um, Mara and Emma in particular, anything I missed that you'd want to add? Um, I just want to emphasize the um, the real the, the real intention and also the fact that intention is not enough to make the committee be fifty percent plus one or um, majority. Um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBT, um, and disability representation. Um, just because it is really easy for organizations to say, um, we want to emphasize this and we're going to try really hard. Um, and it is another thing to do the thing. Um, and so I just want to recognize that it's easy to, to make a commitment and not try. And I think it's really important that um, you know, as a community, we work really hard to do what we can to to abide by the uh, commitment that we made to do our very best to get um, that kind of 50% plus one, just because inherently in a district um, where, well, inherently in Vermont, we're a bazillion a percent white and inherently we are, um, the, the disabilities, um, the community of folks who represent disabilities rights and LGBT rights are numerically smaller, right? They just are. There's no getting around that they are numerically smaller. So inherently, when we go to fill this committee, it is going to be really easy to fill it with a bunch of white, straight, temporarily able-bodied people because there are just numerically more of those folks and a lot of them who are already in positions that we want on this committee, places with voices that we need to hear. So I just really want to emphasize that because I know it's not going to be easy to do and I wanted to say out loud that it's important even if it isn't easy. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Um, any other general comments and then we can, uh, uh, discuss the, the, the charge and, and the composition. Um, and then I think, uh, we need action approving the charge and the composition and the, the timeline, and then we can, uh, 
start soliciting members. Jim, I have, I have some questions, but I don't know if now is the right time or if Emma has something that she wants to add. Um, I don't know how you want to do this. Yep. Um, and if you, if you have anything to add, go ahead. And then also, um, I'm wondering in terms of procedure, uh, should we have someone move and then discuss and amend the charge or should we just have a general discussion first? We probably should have someone move to approve the charge and composition and then we can discuss any amendments and then vote on an amended charge if we have an amended charge. Does that make sense? Yeah, I am particularly interested in what other board members think of the composition in particular, because a lot of um, discussion went into how do we make this balanced? How do we make the composition um, balanced? And, you know, the, depending on the way that you look at it, um, if you consider people to have a bias walking in, if you're a school official, do you have a bias walking in? Um, if you're a city official, do you have a bias walking in? You know, and I'm sure everybody has their own biases, but a lot of discussion um, went into that. And so I'm eager to hear the thoughts of other board members on that. Um, so I don't know if that discussion, like Andrew said, should it happen now or should it happen after a motion is made? I think probably we should have a motion and then have a discussion. I don't know, Ryan, I know you're a parliamentarian, which I know means- I was just gonna say, I'll go ahead. I'll make a motion that we approve the charge that was presented to us in the board packet. Good. I'll say that. Great, um, discussion. Andrew, now now it's- All right. Okay, so I, I, have, a, I have a number of, of questions and comments. Um, first of all, um, this is, very minor, but if we are approving the charge, DEI, I assume means diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I think it would be good to spell that out in the yeah. charge. And it's yeah. spelled out in some places and not in others, so apologize for that. But um, it's all right. Um, I, you know, we've received some public comments on this, and I, I had the same exact comment when I went through this with regard to the survey of stakeholders, um, which is. I wasn't clear, so this is a general question. I wasn't clear why, you know, students, community members, families weren't included in that list of stakeholders for perspectives on the SRO, because I think those are important perspectives. And um, so I don't know what the general thinking is there. So I wanted to ask that. I think we can definitely add them. I think the list was not, um, it is not an exclusive list. I think these were, I think part of the idea, and, and it certainly can be expanded, is that, um, that the committee itself would have representatives of those stakeholder groups in the public and that the people we listed are the people who are involved in the administration of safety in our schools, but will not be directly involved in the committee other than um, there will be representatives, but there's gonna be some key people that we did not want directly involved in the committee, um, like Libby, like the chief, um, you know, like, Bill Frazier, people who are at high level and, you know, decision makers, but people who we feel need to inform the committee about, um, you know, what the day-to-day -day challenges are about their jobs and how, you know, various positions relate to those challenges. Um, but obviously, uh, I, I think it would be easy to uh, include those other groups as well, because we certainly did not mean to exclude them. I think we should um, include it in the language there if, um, yeah. and then, and maybe we can say, but not limited to yeah. something like that. Also, under the aims and expectations, I realized I jumped over one of my other comments. We have um, the well-being of all the district students and staff. 
I'm wondering, and this is this is a general question. You know, it, it's it is students and staff, but it's not just students and staff. I believe we are talking about families that the police sometimes um, works with as well through our schools. I believe, um, and when we're talking about um, the aims and expectations um, of school safety and justice, I I do wonder if it should be something like students, staff, and families, but I, I don't know, maybe that's expanding this too much. I I am, you know, I understand scope creep, but it's just something that I thought about there. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about that. <clears throat> so I think that made sense, but say that again, because in part I was, um, it, under under the aims and expectations, it says in the well-being of all the district students and staff. I wonder if we should expand that to students, staff, and families. Sure, why not? And then um, my several higher higher level um, questions slash comments. One is. So to turn this around by December 2020, by December, you know, we're talking about like two months from now. That's a really tight timeline, and we the committee isn't even formed yet, which can also take some time. Having been there, um, what kind of what? How long do you think it will take to organize the committee, and what kind of meeting schedule are you guys thinking about working on? Because I think this is going to have to be pretty rigorous. It's going to have to be pretty, I mean, that's why we wanted to limit it to the SRO decision by December. Um, uh, so I, my, my feeling is that we take between now and the next meeting to uh, solicit uh, uh, applicants that, that we open up the period till the next meeting. And then at the next meeting, we go over our list of, of applicants and um, you know, the board being guided by the desire to have this be as diverse a committee as possible um, and as representative a committee as possible, uh, you know, choose from the applicants we have. Uh, and then we set a schedule where hopefully we can have, you know, perhaps a meeting in late October, um, maybe a meeting in November where the focus is very much on the SRO position and um, you know, what that entails and, um, you know, how another alternative might, might line up for next year and, you know, and then have a recommendation come to the board by, you know, sometime probably that first or second meeting in December, but you're right. I mean, not only is it a tight time frame, there's the holidays, et cetera, but I think we can get guidance on the SRO by, by December, but it will, you know, it'll probably entail a couple of meetings, one late October, maybe two and, you know, maybe early November, mid November, late October, mid November, whatever. Should we say the end of December? I'm just, I just don't want to set this committee up to miss an important deadline. But I also understand time is of the essence. So, so what does it say right now? It just says by December. I mean, that can be the end of December. Um, you know, people are, you know, once you hit the 20th of December, it's, well, I yeah. guess, you know, people aren't going anywhere this year, but um, they might be um, flipping their laptops down and tuning out for a week or two. Okay. I agree with Andrew, though. Like, a lot of people might read that just semantically as by December. Yeah. Right. right. That's, that was my concern. That's, I read it, I'm like, wow, you're, by the end of November, we're going to have this on our, Plates. And what would happen if um, at the end of December, if that makes it clear? What would happen if the committee um, realized by the end of this December that they weren't going to be able to make a recommendation? Could they extend the deadline, or is the charge the charge? Could it be? I, I think the problem is we've got other deadlines with the yeah you know, the budget. Like, I think the latest once the latest we could make a budget change, Libby. It's it's that like. It's early January, early to mid-January, right? Keep talking. I'll get back to you. I got, I'll just have to pull up the timeline. Yeah. Right. Um, so to my my last my last two thoughts on this, but I, I really appreciate all the work you've done. I think that this is an important issue, which is why I 
thought so much about this and I read it several times. Um, do you think that, that this committee might benefit from a committee chair to kind of organize things? There's no committee chair here. Uh, well, we do have the, the facilitation option, which is something else we need to discuss. Right. Uh, right. That, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the process is a, okay. So I'll, I'll table that. Or do we want to talk about that now? You know, I think it's worthwhile because as we were having this conversation talking about the representation of the groups and the membership, as it's listed here, we have a 14 person committee doing a lot of work in a short amount of time. It is going to be tricky to get that group together, their schedules to align to make this happen. Um, yeah. So I think it is worthwhile pointing that out that if there is a chance to facilitate or to have it a little more structured, it would be worthwhile because we are talking about a big committee from a lot of yeah. different. Um, populations trying to make this happen yeah and that's the next thing i think we need to discuss um is facilitation um so we have we actually have till january 20th on the budget so we could i i think we should put in the charge end of december and if we feel we need a week or two um it's better to have that in our back pocket and extend it and the board could extend it rather than giving us till the deadline because people always take till the deadline uh, it's just human nature so um in light of that though in light of the timeline and i know we're, we're jumping a little but uh ha having a facilitator and you know we can pay for it. I know the city has offered to pay for part of it. If there's discomfort with that, we can pay for the whole thing. Um, I'm not sure this, you know, given the scheduling challenges of a 14 member board, uh, given the need to, you know, think between meetings, you know, synthesize notes, et cetera, make sure the next meeting is a smooth transition from the meeting that just happened. Um, that's going to be a tough charge without someone passed to it. So I think it's a, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead Emma. Um, does the language for a facilitator need to be in the charge? Is that what we're saying? I think we could just do a separate motion um, authorizing uh, authorizing the district to hire uh, I'm assuming it would be uh, Susan and, and Keisha. And I also, on, on that issue, I, I do think we should be the one paying for it. We've had some emails and some different concerns that have been raised about conflicts of interest and the city has a financial stake in this. And ultimately, we aren't, this is a community issue without a doubt. And, you know, taxpayer dollars go, go to the pay the police department. The city council makes decisions about taxpayer dollars, as do we ultimately taxpayers, ultimately, Montpelier residents make decisions about how those resources are used um, after the city council and after the school board put those budgets, which are reflections of our values to the community. Um, but that being said, this really is about school safety and it really is about police involvement in our schools and it's about school justice. And for the price tag, I as I understand it, I, I just think to avoid any of those situations, it's not meant to disrespect the city in any way whatsoever. We need to um, we need to collaborate with the city on this as we do with the community. But I personally think having that level of independence would be helpful. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I really appreciate the city's offer um, and, and it was it was generous of them. But I think for, uh, you know, to ensure that that this is, you know, fully a district venture, um, we should we should be the ones paying for the facilitator. Related to that, um, the issue also came up in emails to board members about the potential of having the city council member and the um, Montpelier Police Department member be non-voting members of the committee um, to protect from any conflict of interest. What do people think about that? So I, that, was, that was the last thing I wanted to ask, ask about actually. Um, and then I'll shut up. Um, but this committee, as I understand it, as I read this charge, does not have any power to make any decisions about this. This committee is making a recommendation to the board, which has the discretion. 
and the board it were the elected representatives for the community you know empowered to make these decisions so i definitely appreciated those concerns and and i do appreciate those concerns but and and i i do think that there are going to be a number of interested parties on this committee um that you know working for the auditor's office for example if if you have a bias in one direction or another, you have to report those types of things. This is not an audit, right? This is this is a community committee that is meant to represent a range of interests to address some major community issues that that we want to that we want to move forward with. So, to that extent, to the fact that that this committee doesn't actually have any decision making power, I'm not certain how much of a risk there is. Um, but that's just my that's just my two cents. I'm curious to hear what other board members have to say. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure this is even a committee that, that might vote. I think the recommendation might be a uh, you know the majority of the committee felt this way. Express you know concerns the other way were expressed by committee member X who stated this. Um, you know here's what the test here here's what we learned from the testimony. Um, so I I think the report's going to be kind of more in a narrative form than, a, you know, by, you know, 12 to 2, we decided to do X. And then there could be like a consensus recommendation with, you know, here are some dissenting opinions. So I'm, I'm not sure we even really empower the committee to vote. They just, you know, have to put together, uh, you know, a report that, that reflects, um, you know, the views of, of the committee, uh, you know, the varying views of the members um, and kind of, you know, the overall consensus recommendation. Great point. Yeah, for what it's what, excuse me, for what it's what, that's how I saw the report coming from the committee that would help the board member make that decision. So the committee, you know, the, the facilitator would, you know, facilitate the meetings and then capture uh, supposedly what the discussion has been and what the different viewpoints are, and the report will contain that, which will help us make that decision when it, when the time comes. So to have the the you know opinions and and uh, recommendations from one or multiple members of that committee. I would agree that I think the narrative and the reporting of what's learned is going to be the most important yeah. thing. And if if through facilitation and communication the committee reached a consensus that would probably be very important information for the board but if ultimately it were you know split six to six to two then probably the specifics of that split is not going to be what's helpful to the board it's going to be the information and the collaboration and the, um, the reporting back on what was learned as opposed to very narrow if you know if it's a very narrow vote on something very specific it's it's not going to be as valuable in any, any event. So I also want to take some time. Um, you know, I'm so appreciative of all the work that the Just Schools Initiative has done. And so much time and thought has been put into um, their various communications with the board. And recently, they've um, given us some recommendations as to what might be included in this charge. And so I just wanted to go through some of those and make sure that we were considering those thoroughly as we vote on the charge. Should I just get started? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we already, Andrew already addressed the survey of stakeholders issue. Um, and then there's a there's a call to um, gather data, and I think we sort of say that in the charge, um, but we could be more explicit with the language there. I'm trying to I'm going back and forth between two documents, <laughs> so if anyone wants to help out, yeah. um, I think we could put in. Will I have a in order to conduct this analysis? It will, comma using, you know, data as available. Yeah, and it could even be something as um, it could be something that we do after the December. You know, I mean, I think some of the data will help guide um, the conversation needed to make a recommendation in December, but further data could be gathered after. Yeah. 
Um, there's also a there's also a line item, a bullet point underneath um, in the proposed charge, the first bullet point, and then the sub, the last sub bullet point is um, how the SRO position and district safety. Um, and then just really quickly on that last point with regard to data, I interpreted it as not not just creating a data set from existing data, but beginning to collect data on. Um, some of these actions and some of these issues. That yeah, we're yeah, I did too. So it's like the, um, we recommend that the charge include the exploration and reporting of data or lack of data. Um, and then there's a list of things. So SRO arrests, referrals to the Community Justice Center and other interventions, um, complaints against the SRO, broader exclusionary disciplinary practices broken down. So. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's sort of twofold. Do we have the? Is there any data that we have that's district data, or from the police department or from the city, um, and and take a look at that, and then explore the possibility of how do we collect that data in the future? I mean, some of that data is not public, right? I mean, if children are involved in the criminal justice system, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not a public data source. That we Our end size is also too small. Yeah, right. That's another. Issue. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to have legal limitations on what we can can look at, and that's like just honestly. Yeah. Not that anymore. That can be helpful for informing conversation about this, though, as well. Um, I know from the work that our office does, whenever we deal with FERPA data, it's really, really restrictive, even more so than HIPAA, and PHI, and PPI data. Um, so there's a list of questions that I just want to make sure that they were answered. It seems like the, um, most of them were, it's, what will the process be for selecting committee members? And we talked about putting out a call, a public call, and people would be sending in um, a letter of interest to apply to be on the committee. Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. I think we can you know, hopefully put some info on our, our website and um, maybe have Libby send out an announcement and have the principal set out an announcement to asking for, you know, interested parents and community members to uh, submit a letter and, um, you know, it can go to, uh, it can go to give me, probably having it go to me is the cleanest, um, just giving them, you know, one email and then I can forward, forward them along to the board as I get them. Um, who is responsible for choosing the designated representatives from the school district, city council, students, etc.? The board. So typically when administrators serve on a committee, they're chosen by the superintendent. Yeah. Are we going to stick to that? I think we stick to that, but I think, you know, Libby, I think would, would forward us the names of those she you know, that are interested that you'd recommend. And I think we'd have the final say, I'm, I'm guessing we'd be on the same page about that. And, but, um, I, does that make sense? No, that makes sense to me. And I mean, I, I mean, it, it seems to me in terms of the city council, they can kind of decide, I mean, if multiple members of the city council want to express an interest to the board, then I guess the board can decide if the city council wants to send the delegate. Yeah. They can send a delegate. I, I will say too, I do think there is, with regard to some of the conflict of interest issues, I do see real value to a city council member being on this because of their ability to coordinate with the rest of the city and make requests of the city that we frankly might not get the same response on. I found that with the MS, MS building committee, having a couple of city council members was very, very helpful. And then the police representative will also have provide, be able to provide very quick um, insights into issues that a lot of us don't know that some people might know a lot a lot about, but a lot of us don't know a lot about. So I do think there's value to those stakeholders being involved in this process. What do you think about the balance of stakeholders, the, the number of people 
for various stakeholders. I mean, that's you in general, all of the board members, not just Andrew. So the, the way I do the math is that there's three community members, two students, and three board members. So that's eight out of 14 who are really people that represent the community overall. And then more six slots reserved for more specific stakeholders within the, the school and the city. It seemed like a good like a good balance to me. I agree that I think board members um, represent the community. I wonder if that will be the perception of the public or if they will be seen as school officials. You know, it's a fine line, you know, what hat you're wearing. I mean, we do have three separate community members. Um, I mean, we are the community's representatives for the district. Um, I mean, we're chosen by the community, not the not the administration, and we're accountable to the community. I I personally I personally think it's it's pretty balanced. And in addition to the eight that you mentioned. Bridget, there's also the city council member who also is held directly accountable to the public and is meant to represent the public and city city matters. Um, I, one one thing I I will I will say is with this tight timeline, getting all these schedules to align is going to be very very difficult yeah. as is. So, yeah, fourteen member committee is. Um, that's big. Yeah. I mean, I think we need it to be that size to be representative, but um, it's, it's a big committee. It's big and the first meeting will just be kind of setting the context. Yeah. So you kind of lose the first meeting just laying out the background, the directions, the structure, I, I am indebted to you guys for pulling this together and thank you for doing all that work. Um, it was really nice to see this and I think the makeup makes a lot of sense. Um, for me, what I was really looking for, which I do see here, is that we're not starting from just the place of SRO or no, it's what, what the problems are that we're trying to solve and what our students and our staff and our families need and then what are the resources we need to get there, not just one path. So I think it was really wise to set that timeline. And I understand the concern about getting the committee together that quickly, but I think we do have to try because I would like to be able to make that, you know, start January off with, with some solid um, information specifically about the budgetary impact and then to have that little bit more time to really talk about stepping back and addressing the problems because simply having or not having the SRO position doesn't undo a lot of those problems. And some of the examples that we've heard of what we need as a district for safety for our students are not gonna go away. And we need to make sure that we actually do have those resources in place in some way so that our students and our staff and our community can stay safe. So I think considering the, the, the timeline and considering the charge, um, I think I don't know that there's any other way that you folks could have gone to set this up and pull this together. And, and I do think it's going to be really hard to keep sort of steering back to the one that's due in December versus the larger conversation. That'll probably be the biggest challenge. But if you're successful at that, then I think it um, I think it can work. Thank you. I have one other question just um, that I'll direct to Jerry and Ryan. There, there was, um, we made an effort to try to be in inclusive of the Roxbury School District. And so we might need help <laughs> making sure to recruit a Roxbury member, community member. Absolutely. Um, Maybe so. a question. I'm pretty sure that the charge does, in general, cover the question. But for me, one of the important things that's kind of come to the surface through all these discussions is there really is a lot of fuzzy area between the district and the police department in terms of contract and salaries and budgets. 
And I would really hope that when the report comes out in either the December or March um, report, we have a lot of recommendation, but we do have a bit of an answer on what would be the best way to structure an SRO or a similar position if that were to be the case. And so we don't end up in the same murky area that we are right now. Um, so I'm pretty sure it would be covered in the general terms of the charge, but I could just want to state that to make sure that it might not have been overlooked. No, I think it definitely was considered, um, it, can, it can be put in more specifically, um, just a line about including formalizing the relationship between the district and the city P police department. It, does, right it does though say define aims and expectations of the role and conduct. Um, but yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, Ryan, you'd like to see something a little more formalized between have it, be more established, whatever that relationship is between the police department and the district. Is that what you're saying? I am, yes. If it were to continue to, if the district were to continue to have an SRO position, I think it does make a lot of sense for us to be able, as representatives of the community, to tell the community this is the board's control over the position, or it's not how the administrators react to the, not how they react, but the oversight that the administrators have versus the police department, just so that we're clear on how the relationship is established. Do, how about, how about this? Um, my sense is that that charge is in there and if there is a recommendation to continue with the SRO to, or to continue with some other formalized relationship, that would probably be a recommendation of the committee to the board, that it be formalized in an MOU. Do, should we leave that to what the decision of the committee is? And if the, if the committee comes back and say, says, you know, we feel that, you know, an SRO or a police liaison that's different from the SRO be established. And um, we feel that that needs to be formalized along these four principles in an MOU rather than a charge for it to come up with an MOU, because it, it might decide that the best relationship is that, you know, the district treats the, or the city PD treats the district like, it would treat any other entity in the city. Mm -hmm. well, I think it does make sense because it will depend on what the recommendation ends up being. Um, but yeah, I think it is probably covered in general in the charge as written, but I did just want to raise that question. Any other comments or questions? Or um, I think we probably need a motion to approve the charge as amended because there's been some some changes um most of which i think i've at least jotted down in notes um i have a motion to approve the charge as amended well, can, you, can, you read the, can you read through the changes so there's a record of what we're approving Um, so the major ones I had, uh, spell out diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, include that the safety concerns of student, staff, and families, uh, under proposed charge in order to conduct this analysis at will using data as available. And by available, there is a discussion that that also means what the, the district can, um, uh, can disclose in, in addition to what it also has. Um, so available in terms of a public sense. Uh, survey the stakeholders, uh, this will include, but is not limited to the ones we have listed, uh, plus families, students, and community members. Um, and that the, the committee will meet the following timeline uh, with the resource officer position, with a recommendation of the resource officer position being at the end of December rather than December 2020. Um, those are the changes I have. Did I, anything I missed? Were we gonna add any language around data? I'm sorry, did I miss that? Yeah, I did say that, that we will evaluate, uh, conduct analysis that will 
This is using data as is available. So Ryan, would you accept a friendly amendment to your motion that the charge be approved as amended? I would be happy to accept the amendments as presented by Chair Murphy. Um, do you have a second? A second. Um, Jill. Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Connecticut? Aye. Emma? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Gary? Aye. Mara? Aye. And I believe that's everyone. Um, and then I think the second piece is to approve the district hiring of um, facilitators to um, facilitate the committee. Jim, do we also need to appoint board members to this committee as well, or is that? This is doing all next week when we have everyone. I think it's it's likely to be the same three, but um, that's just the committee. That's the point the committee call is one when we get applicants next week. That's good. I would move that the board um, hire facilitators to chair and facilitate, not to chair, but to facilitate this committee. Do you have a second? I second it. Uh, any discussion? Yeah, really briefly, is Libby, does that come out of fund balance? because we're not budgeted for that. I first check what the board's budget is because you have a budget as well. So we, and you don't use it all usually. Okay. So I, I check what that is first and then yes, the rest of it would come out of fund balance. Okay. And we're talking about an amount of roughly $4,800. Yes. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Anakin? Aye. Emma? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Gary? Aye. Mara? Aye. Great. Uh, so we are now on to um, board training. Um, and only half an hour behind schedule. So, uh, uh, so Mara, thanks for the reading, and I will I will turn it over to you in the interest of of uh, getting going. Awesome. So I have a proposal for you, board folk, um, and I don't know if it's possible given that this is meant to take place in the public portion of the meeting, but. In order to allow us to ever go to sleep on time, I was going to um, make ask that you watch the video portion maybe separately so that we don't have to spend those extra 20 to 25 minutes. Um, I, I don't know how to make that available to the public except to offer them a link. But if that's okay and we're allowed to do that, then I will gladly cut those 20 to 25 minutes off. <laughs> Allowed? Yes! Who's everyone's favorite board member right now? Mara. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what I want to do is we're going to discuss um, the work that Tama Okun did on um, trying to describe white supremacy culture in organizations. Now, one of the things that the video was going to do was it was going to kind of break down what is systemic racism, what is white supremacy culture? Sometimes when we use these words, people freak out a little bit, right? Like they sound like big, heavy, scary words, and they contain words like racism and white supremacy in them, which automatically make people think like Ku Klux Klan, right? Levels of that's what we're talking about. But that's not actually what we're talking about when we talk about systemic racism or white supremacy culture. And mind you, the same way that we're talking about systemic racism, we could be talking about systemic, um, systemic sexism, 
systemic heterosexism, systemic cissexism, systemic, you know, preference for the middle class, right? So um, it, we're talking about race because I want to specifically center race as a discussion because it's really important that we do that. But I want us to understand that all of these isms operate in similar fashions, even when they're separated from one another. And a lot of times they're actually just enmeshed with one another. So I don't want people to think like, okay, well, we're only talking about racism and we're not talking about all of the other things that are discriminatory. We're talking about racism because it's a really central critical um, discussion to have. And because we can kind of copy out some of the strategies and understandings from starting to get a capture on what we're talking about when we talk about systems. So I'll just start with the systems piece. When we say stuff like systemic racism or um, people say something like, oh, the biases are baked into the system. What do we mean by system? I'm guessing that's not rhetorical. No, it's not. Because <laughs> you want some answers there. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's everything that's around us. Every process, place that's, that we have cohabitate in. Absolutely. That, that's really actually a really awesome description, Libby. Thank you. So, so the systems, when we talk about it, sometimes you'll hear people say things like, that's a cultural construct, right? That's not real. It's a cultural construct. We, as human beings, created the world in which we live. It shifts all the time, but we create the reality in which we live. So we decided what the rules were gonna be as we moved into animal husbandry, right? We decided what the rules were gonna be as we moved into agricultural sustainability, right? Humans over time have decided how they were gonna be with one another and how they were gonna operate together who had the right to do what thing in what place. And sometimes those systems are really formalized, like we discuss the rules and we agree to them. And sometimes the systems are actually more along the lines of what you think of as culture, right? The unspoken norms that we teach to one another, even when they aren't officially rules on how we're supposed to act. If you ever want to test what we mean by cultural norms, if you are a person who grew up in, um, say, a metropolitan area of the United States that had elevators, but that also catered predominantly to white people, you can experience physically what our norms are like if you get too close to other people on the elevator. So some piece, pieces of culture are like no one ever comes to anyone and says, hey, in our culture growing up in Iowa, you are allowed to stand this far from other people in the elevator or you will get in trouble. No one ever does that, right? But we learn through observation, we learn through listening, we learn through paying attention to consequences, what the rules of how things are going to be are. And so we learn things like lots of folks who come who come from like white culture and especially who come from like a middle class white culture, like and in the United States, especially like a lot of personal space between them. We have like a specified actual amount of personal space. Um, it's actually kind of interesting that we will mentally move, we will move ourselves physically away from people. Now this is pre-COVID, before the, um, the circle around you needed to be six feet in any direction. But you can actually notice what happens if you watch in elevators or on park benches, if people get too close to one another when the folks don't know each other. And you can also watch what the differences are if people might, if people are maybe coming from different 
cultural realities. So that's what I mean. When we say culture, we, we mean what are the ways that we live amongst one another, the things we accept as normal, the things we accept as good and bad, even if we don't talk about them out loud. And then the systems part of it gets even more formalized when we talk about what laws are we going to agree to? What are the paperwork things going to look like? What is the physical environment going to look like? Those are the systems. So all this to say that is what the video more or less would have said to you so that we could understand just a baseline about what we're talking about with systems. That said, the whole concept that Tema Okun gets at in her work around white supremacy culture is that there are elements of culture in the United States and around the world that are shaped by the culture that has dominant power. And when we're talking in racial terms, that means white people. And that is coming from a history of you know colonialism around the world it's not an inherent way obviously that humans had to be if you know dominance and power had worked out differently we would have different isms that we're addressing but the united states comes as a result specifically of European domination of this space, this land, the people on it, all of the things, the cultures, the understandings, the objects, all of the things that were here were overtaken, sometimes eliminated, sometimes erased, and those things were replaced with white ways of doing things. And those things are often unexamined. So that is why I assigned this article. Because the first time I read the list of Tema Okun's white supremacy culture in organizations, I said, no, that's just how you're supposed to run things. <laughs> Which is exactly the point of white supremacy culture. And that is to say there is one right way of doing things and this is the right way to do them, and other ways to do them are inferior or less good or less effective in some way. So what I would love for you first to give me is just to the extent that you've got, um, that you have some courageousness, talk about in, let's say five words or less, emotions, so that's feeling words, right, um, that you felt or ways your body felt as you were reading the assignment. So we're focusing on emotions and the way our body felt, not things that you were thinking about, not things you were pondering, no reflections, just things you felt. Anyone bored folks willing to offer some things that you were feeling as you read. I can start. Do you want me to start? The brave superintendent. I can, I felt disappointed because it doesn't have the answers in there for me. Disappointment. What are some other feelings people had? Anger, sadness. I just I thought of examples okay. throughout my life, and like every I was like, oh yeah, that's that. I I see that manifest itself. I see this concept manifest itself in the workplace, like with ah, okay. perfectionist so in certain workplaces. You felt some recognition. Yeah. I, I definitely felt recognition too. I also felt a sense of of change and <clears throat> generational change, as much as as diversity. I, I, um, yeah, a sense of change is good. We're I, really going to focus hard on the emotions part here. And let me tell you exactly why we're doing that, because good pedagogy explains to you how your brain is working so that you can learn it better in the future. We are working on the emotions part because one critical part 
of white supremacy culture, of white culture in general, is not discussing feelings not couching things in terms of feelings, and often not even being able to identify one's own feelings. So that's, we are literally undoing white supremacy as we do this exercise right this second, focusing on, oh, a lot of the culture that I grew up with tells me to think about this first, but that it's going to be a little bit weird if I just tell all these people what my feelings are. If you're getting the sense that something I'm asking you feels a little bit weird or a little bit awkward, that is probably an indicator that that's a dominant culture piece at work that we're going to do some work to get through. So I really appreciate this. Did anyone notice any body sensations, things you felt in your body as we were doing this? as you were doing this reading? I think if I'd read it for something like this for the first time, I may have been a little, I may have bristled that a little more, but I've, I've been through a lot of diversity trainings, a lot of these concepts. I've, I've, internalized. Dude, and Jerry, were you going to say a thing? I was going to say, um, like anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of us, when we encounter the, um, things like this for the first time, or even for, you know, several times out, there's a tension that rises and that tension can even be like in your body. You can be noticing like, what when I read this for the first time and someone asked me these questions, I realized that I had been compulsively taking the cap off of my pen. My body had been compulsively managing its stress. And I actually had developed a little bit of like a cut because I had been so like my body was managing the stress without my conscious input. And that means that there was a lot for it to be processing. Stuff that I didn't even realize was going to cause me stress to read it. So if at times you felt stressed, angry, anxious, sad, confused, maybe even hopeful, if you noticed like, oh, I can see some places where this change, a lot of those things create tension. And I just want to also mention that as we're diving into this, because some of that tension is also a defense mechanism that keeps us from talking about this, that makes it so physically, emotionally, and mentally uncomfortable to even read about that we put it down. That is actually part of the function of that sort of uh, one of the things that you saw in there was like defensiveness or right to comfort. Those things are actually part of the culture that serve to protect the culture from changing. So, so just something for us to notice that if you felt anything along the lines of like, uh, this really makes me uncomfortable. I don't really enjoy reading this, that that is actually some of how the system keeps perpetuating. I say that, board members, administrators, and assorted community wonderful people, because those are the things that will keep us from doing the change that we need to do. It will keep us from having the conversations we need to have. It will keep us from having the conversations at the depth we need to have them. It will keep us from raising a point when we have a concern. It will keep us from speaking up at the Thanksgiving table or in the grocery store or at grandma's house for a birthday, wherever you are that you're with other people and you notice things come up that like seem like, oh, that doesn't feel right, but I don't feel like I'm supposed to talk about it or I feel like it'd be really awkward. Helpful for you to notice that that's also part of the culture working. So that's part of our job to push through. I say that because this SRO discussion, if you haven't noticed, is going to be replete with that stuff. And this is going to be something that we dive into for months. So 
just think about the fact that your body and your mind will sometimes be resistant to change pieces. And it is your job to push through the discomfort and keep doing the work anyway. All right. So I also have another question that's pretty basic, and that is, what surprised you or interested you? Or what's something you came across in there and you're like, huh? Specifically that noise, no other curious noises. And for this one, if possible, I'd love to hear from at least one thing from everyone who read the article. It's, um, my response was it felt very American. It's very reflective of our current conflict and transition we're in right now. A lot of it has been the bill of goods we've been sold that makes you a good worker or uh, whatever. And that that's what we've been indoctrinated into. <laughs> So I have a, a somewhat similar reaction, um, mainly because I came here um, when I was an adult. So getting into this culture um, from a completely different culture, to me, this is how things are. And so to be able to integrate, I have to pick up on these things and, and rule with it. So reading the article, it's like, oh, this is, you know, this is what I've been told or, you know, I've seen it. Um, and that's not right, or, you know, that, that, that's the kind of reaction I had. For me, one of the, the interesting things was the connectivity of the different concepts, like perfectionism and defensiveness. Like, you know, we should be able to have honest, con honest conversations about what's working well and what's not working well and be open to examining those issues but you know these concepts of this perfectionism striving for like this perfect way of being and not and and putting on like this front paired with like the defensiveness of when you identify something that's imperfect how like that's just an example of how these concepts come together and many of these concepts to me represented obviously they're toxic elements of our culture but they they're, they're huge barriers to progress in so many facets of our lives. And I, I, like I said, I just saw so many examples as I'm reading through this. I like see so many examples in the workplace and so many examples in everyday life. Um, but lots of, lots of good examples of people. Um, I, I could think of at the same time, of people trying to move beyond these, these um, ways of thinking, these structures. So. Yeah, no, I think it, it, it captured um, you know, the culture we have particularly in the workplace is really rewards self-promotion and I think has a bit of a, a zero sum game approach to, um, kind of power and, and influence. And I think it captured a lot of the, you know, the unspoken things that we kind of think of as virtues that, that, uh, are really impediments. Ooh, I love that word. Think of as virtues. And I also don't want to imply that these things are inherently bad. Yeah. What they are are things that we don't acknowledge all the time, but that often we do think of as a good worker is one who does a ton of work all the time, works overtime, put, produces, 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 right? Good. Virtues. Ooh, I like that one. What else? I have the huh reaction on the piece about the worship of the written word because that's pretty much what I do <laughs> right all the time anyway so for that reason it, you know it made me pause and stop and think about that and then I also was thinking about the conversation we had in policy committee recently about how dense some of these policies that are supposed to be promoting equity how they're written in such an incredibly dense and legalistic way so Anyway, I was struck by just how deeply entrenched and how many anecdotes and how relatable they were. And it just started to feel overwhelming really quickly because um, I tend to be like a solution oriented person and I like to problem solve. And so when I start, you know, the further and further I got into it, I'm like, oh, this is <laughs> so much. And I, I tend to try to like pick out little things and um, 
and try to implement those things and, and work on, you know, one or two goals at a time, but it, but it definitely was a lot. So I guess for me, having grown up in a very German small town culture, um, I always thought of it as that culture and not American culture. So that would be sorry, dogs. That would be sort of an aha moment, like, oh, it's not my little town culture. It's actually the whole country. And and the reason I say that is because I have worked my whole career with extremely diverse teams. I'm married into an Indian family. So I, you know, I've, I've kind of embraced all these different cultures and I love learning about different cultures, but I always thought of my original foundational culture as that small town German rather than American. So that was kind of aha moment. Like, oh, okay, this is just American. Anyone else? Hey, Laura, I can share an apology with you. I actually wish I could. Been... my assignment, Ryan. I unfortunately did not. To be honest, I would have rather spent my time doing this challenging work than <laughs> what's been on my plate for the last week. But yeah, I apologize. I'm not going to be able to be a great part of the conversation this evening. That's totally okay, because sometimes there are limitations on what you're capable of, and thank you. So I want to just respond to a couple of the things that came up, and then we are, and I know this is going to sound kind of simultaneously relieving and frustrating, then we're going to be done for tonight. We're not actually going to do a lot with this, because I want you to spend some time really noticing. So I'm going to give homework, if you will. So one thing that I wanted to mention is we heard like good worker. And that really comes out when we look at our like our our quantity over quality, our sense of urgency, how fast can you get things done, perfectionism, how close are you to perfect, and how much do you do you get it right all the time. A lot of these things are things that we see as being virtues, like Jim said, of good workers, good people in the United States. Now, I say in the United States, there, there are other places in the world where lots of these white culture pieces are similarly part of the foundational, like, organizational culture of the area. But when we talk about the United States, it is a little bit different because the United States is not and never has been only white people, right? The, the land here did not start out start out populated by white people. And the number of people living in the United States bringing different cultures and different ideas is staggering, right? When a lot of us grew up hearing that America is a melting pot. But something that is true is that America, sometimes the way Anakit identified, is a melting pot in that it kind of requires you to, to melt down into the same thing that everything else is. When in fact, we could be a tossed salad, right? We could be a composite thing that was made up of lots of different ways of doing things. But a lot of what we do, especially in um, business culture and in education is require people to be the same all the time and try to shape them into being this kind of good worker model or to value the, th the things that we value, like that sense of urgency, being on time, um, 
all of those things that sometimes you're even like, well, what would we even be? How could you even function if you didn't value being on time? So I just want to play with that one, not only because good worker, but good student falls in that line too, right? Our idea of who a good student is sometimes also conforms to these expectations. And so that leads me to a next piece, which is um, Andrew raised the idea of barrier to progress. In some ways, these cultural values are intended to try to push things forward faster but in only one direction, right? So that all the things that we build keep being based on and in line with all of these values that we already had. But it does mean that we lose out on all of the things that come from creativity, diversity of thinking, diversity of experiences. So an uh, interesting fact that I learned when I was a study abroad advisor was that Articles that are published in peer-reviewed journals um, that have multinational authors on them rather than being from any one nation that are actually cited at a much higher rate. And they often produce better scholarship overall that gets used by more people than places that were one team from one country. So a team of only Americans, only Japanese people, only South African people often doesn't produce the same level of work that groups that have people coming from lots of different experience levels do. There are lots of examples of that. It's not just in academic paper writing, but it's a chance again for us to think if our idea of what is good, if our idea of what is appropriate, if our idea even of what is lawful, and to bring in Bridget's point, like we, law is a way that we function. In some ways we use law to try to create equality. And then we, what we have to have there as kind of like a backup is an understanding that no one way that we do things is going to result in the best possible outcome. Trying lots of different stuff, experimenting, breaking our own rules sometimes is much more likely to result in not only a culture where everybody can feel a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more like they can be themselves instead of having to change to be something else, but also means we get the benefits of people's authentic experiences and authentic perspectives. So that's also a thing that I think a lot about in the classroom and with learners. It's a lesson that we've had a really, really long, hard time grappling with when we think about things like access and ability. When it comes to thinking about what is learning, what is school, does an assistantship somewhere count? Does the tech center count? Because the answer once upon a time would have been no, right? So as we expand our idea of what it means to be learning and what it means to be a good learner and what it means to be a good worker and a good contributor to our community, it's going to mean that we push on some of these pieces that we read here in this article. Um, and a last, and another thing that I wanted to address real fast, that worship of the written word, gets at another thing that I want to make sure we go away from this particular talk with. And that is, just because something can be limiting or can be a barrier or can be operating in a way that is holding people back or doing damage of some kind, doesn't mean that it doesn't also still have some functions that we may need. So worship of the written word, when we're talking about white supremacy culture, sometimes what we're saying is, well, if I can just write this document in a way that you can't understand it, I can always get my way. Or if I can just say that we never wrote it down and you didn't know that that was the rule, I get to do the thing I wanted to because I made up the rule about writing it down and the law says we had to write it down, right? 
But on the other side of that is stuff like if you never write anything down, it becomes really easy to take advantage of people and say, no, we never said that. We never agreed on that. So I want us to understand that with these things, there's often a balance that can be achieved. We're not saying throw away all sense of time. We're not saying throw away your sense of what comfort is or throw away the written word. We're saying notice the patterns and notice the places where we hold them so rigidly that it could be blocking people out. But then also take the opportunity to notice what would happen if we let go of this completely? Who might be locked out then? So that's just a piece to keep thinking about in, in multi-directions. Um, and I think, like I said, I'm going to send you the video, but what I'd really love for you to do, sort of going away from here, this won't be the only time you ever have this discussion, start trying to notice and maybe even take a few notes of places in your everyday life where you see this crop up. When we're in board meetings, I, I have mentioned on more than one occasion that I'm like, Robert's Rules of Order is white supremacy culture. Because it is. It is a culture's way of saying this is how we have to do literally everything that sometimes locks out the ability to do dialogue or the ability to be more flexible. So look for ways that things like this might trigger in your mind. Jot them down and ruminate. And that is literally your homework, is to just notice things that are happening in your work environment, in your board environment. Notice things that are coming out of kids' mouths, right? Because we start teaching this stuff to one another really early. So that's it. All right, I'm done. Let's, let's do the next thing. Thank you, Mara. Um, Thank you, Mara. Yeah, that was excellent. And um, all your trainings have been excellent. Um, we're super, super happy you're willing to do them and um, super glad you're you're on the board and uh, able to guide us through these things because they're, they're tough and needed conversations. Um, so next item, and I have misplaced my agenda, um, I believe is the... Policy monitoring, I think. Policy monitoring. Um, here's my agenda. Um, fourth reading of the transgender and gender non conforming students policy. Um, any questions or additions uh, or edits? Otherwise, um, we, did, we didn't get the new version until earlier today, correct? The, it's important to note that the new version would have had one word difference. Do we want oh. to identify where that one word difference would be so that people could glance at it? It's in the, it's toward the bottom where we talk about um, former or current students having the capacity to change records. And we just took out current because the rest of the document refers to how we're dealing with current students. And that paragraph specifically refers to if you're a former student and therefore you interact with the school differently than you would if you were a pupil, what does it look like for you? Does that sound like a good sum up, Emma, Bridget, Ryan? Thanks, Mark. Yeah. yeah, that was the only difference. And maybe just to re-clarify, the policy that's in front of us right now was the same policy that we read two meetings ago. There is no changes actually made. They had been discussed and somehow got included in the draft that came out on Friday, but the one that's in front of us right now was the same policy that we read back in September. Which should I feel be like maybe good Bridget now. could explain why we left the language the same. My brain is not ready to explain our logic there, but um, I, I can. I can, I can yes. Yeah. So, so when the language was here before, there were concerns. There's a question raised about why the piece about former students didn't include current students and the policy committee discussed it and as Mara said the rest of the policy is about how the um, district interacts with its current students and there really isn't a cons and actually a, a big part of the challenge of how we interact with our current students can be 
that we have students who identify differently from their legal name for a period of time. And so that's kind of, so that's like the, a big focus of how um, we want to have guidance for the district in how the district interacts with current students. This piece about former students and the focus on a legal name change is kind of, a, it's just a different piece. That's because former students might never, you know, they might otherwise not have any basis for the district to be able to change their records unless we put this in there because normally there's not much interaction between former students and the district where things would be. So, we, so it's a specific protection for, for former students to make sure that their records can be updated. It's really a different issue. And I think we're just trying to keep the two things separate. Um, the, guide, the guidance for current students is a separate thing from former students. Did any uh, questions or can we consider it red? So is this ready for adoption next uh, board meeting? I, th I think it may be. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it's been a long, so, long journey, but I think, we're almost I, think I think that means it can go on the consent agenda at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bridget, because you know we'd probably ask you that anyway. Well, we'd ask Ryan, and then Ryan is figure it out. <laughs> this has been a year plus long effort, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you to the policy committee for it's yeah. arrived at a great place. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, well crafted and well thought through. Um, so finally, policy monitoring of student attendance and student freedom of expression in school-sponsored media. Um, do you have any questions or discussions about that? Otherwise, we can um, have a motion to approve the monitoring reports. I move to approve the policy monitoring reports. I have a second? Second. Um, any discussion? No? Uh, Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Connecticut? Aye. Emma? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mara? Aye. And Bridget? Aye. So approved. Um, next is motion to adjourn. Bridget, do you want the honors? I'll move we adjourn. Uh, I second it. Uh, Jill? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Connecticut? Aye. Emma? Aye. Gary? Aye. Mara? You're welcome, and I. <laughs> uh, and Bridget. Hi. Thank you all, and again, um, huge thanks to Bridget for all her her fantastic work over the, the many many years. Um, we we will miss you. Um, Definitely. But you have certainly put in your time, and I'm sure it will be nice to have your Wednesday nights back. So. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you.